In this video, we'll be exploring seven lesser known unique 3D printer filaments for you to try out. So whether you're a relative beginner or a veteran 3D printing enthusiast, stay tuned because I can guarantee that you'll discover something new. Let's get after it. Recently, I was overwhelmed by the viral success of my advanced filaments video, the second in my series of videos teaching you about all the different types of filament, what they're good for, and what to watch out for. If you haven't already seen both of those videos, you can click up here to open a playlist in a new tab and check those out. Then come back here or watch this one first. Do whatever you want. I'm not your dad. The format goes like this. We'll learn about the material characteristics of each filament, the strengths and weaknesses of printing with it, its printability on consumer grade 3D printers, and how it compares to other filaments. Then, once we understand those elements of each filament, we'll look at some of the ideal use scenarios and examples so that you have a better understanding of exactly what you can and should be printing with each of these filaments. Oh, and by the way, let me take a moment to quickly thank Filamentum, Rav Mehmad, and Filament Tech for providing these filaments for free or heavily discounted so that I could make this video for all of you. I'll put links in the description below so you can check them out, especially if you're here in Israel. Here we go. To kick us off, let's talk about polyether block amide. Amide. Amide? Amide? Commonly known as piba. You may have never even heard of it. I certainly hadn't before I began researching this video, but this filament is a hidden gem in the world of 3D printing, offering a remarkable blend of flexibility, strength, and durability. PIBA stands out for its exceptional flexibility and elasticity, making it akin to rubber in its physical properties. It exhibits high resistance to wear and tear and boasts excellent chemical resistance, which is not commonly found in more popular filaments like PLA or ABS. Now, one of the key features of PIBA is its ability to return to its original shape after bending or stretching, showcasing really superior elastomeric properties. But what makes it different from a lot of other flexible filaments, and which I'll cover in the comparison section, is its energy return. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, the major, major strength of PIBA lies in, again, its flexibility and durability, which opens up opportunities for printing parts that require significant bending or stretching or abuse without damage. It also excels in energy return, a unique property that, again, we'll cover in just a second when we compare it to other filaments. Additionally, unlike pretty much any other filament that I've come across, PIBA can maintain its mechanical properties in extremely hot or extremely cold temperatures, even as low as negative 60 degrees Celsius. Now, as for weaknesses, PIBA is, like many flexible filaments, quite hygroscopic, which can be a huge pain to deal with, and you probably want to print it directly from a filament dryer. Additionally, PIBA's somewhat niche application range means that it might not be as widely used or available as more general purpose filaments. So it's not only more costly, but you're also not likely to find ready-made profiles for it in your slicer. Which leads us to printability. Like all flexible filaments, PIBA can be a bit of a pain if there is play in your extruder or if you don't have a direct drive extruder setup. And like all flexible filaments, you will need to slow things down to print it properly. You're probably gonna have the most success printing it at 230 to 250 degrees C and a bed temperature of 70 to 90 degrees Celsius. Some brands do recommend using a heated chamber, but I found that it's not strictly necessary. Honestly though, printing this stuff was pretty easy and I was actually shocked that my very first print turned out beautifully with no issues whatsoever. PIBA is more flexible than TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane, another popular flexible filament that we covered in the first video in this series. But it does offer better energy return and abrasion resistance. In layman's terms, this means that you not only get more durability, but also more bounce for the ounce. Sorry, I just had to. But to demonstrate that, I printed out solid infill balls of TPU, PIBA, and chinchilla, which we're going to be covering in just a minute, and then I swung them from the same height against a hard surface. And yes, it hurt like hell to waste this much of such an expensive filament for a one-time test, so if you appreciate the video, please do take a moment to like and subscribe. Anyways, let's take a look at the results.
Pretty cool, right? Whereas TPU tends to become extremely solid and almost doesn't feel flexible at all once you have a certain number of layers or thickness, Piba and also Chinchilla will retain their squishiness even when they are thick or completely solid. But at 70 euros for a 500 gram spool, this stuff is extremely pricey and it's best reserved for applications where its properties are really, really needed. So let's talk about those. Piba is of course ideal for applications that demand high flexibility, durability. You get the idea, I've talked about this. It's perfect for printing parts like gaskets, tubes, seals, and flexible hinges, particularly if those parts are going to be subjected to chemicals or extreme temperatures. But because of its energy return properties, it also really excels for creating wearable items or sports equipment and specialized tools that need to withstand repeated flexing and stretching. The best example of this in my mind is a shoe or even a shoe sole, which needs to have great energy return, superior flexibility, and of course, abrasion resistance. It's also why in the medical field, PIBA is used for printing things like custom orthopedic insoles or other flexible medical devices. By the way, I've actually been toying with the idea of trying to design my own custom barefoot style shoes and then printing them out using Piba. So let me know in the comments below if that's a video that you'd be interested in watching because this stuff isn't cheap. Up next, let's look at PCCF or polycarbonate carbon fiber, which you guys overwhelmingly responded was missing from my previous video on advanced filaments. PCCF filament combines the incredible strength and heat resistance of polycarbonate with the rigidity and durability of a carbon fiber composite, making it an exceptional choice for demanding applications. PCCF filament is renowned for its high strength to weight ratio thanks to the carbon fiber reinforcement. Polycarbonate, as you may already know if you watched the previous video, is incredibly strong all by itself. But by adding in that carbon fiber, we can not only enhance its structural integrity, but also reduce the overall weight of the printed part because carbon fiber is less heavy than just having pure polycarbonate. Like all polycarbonate, it does exhibit excellent thermal resistance and maintains its properties under a wide range of temperatures, but it exceeds standard polycarbonate due to the addition of carbon fibers, which make it superior to many of the standard filaments in terms of heat resistance. No surprises there. Now, the primary strength of PCCF lies in, again, its robustness and its heat resistance, which makes it suitable for parts that will be exposed to very high temperatures or mechanical stresses. However, the rigidity of PCCF can be a drawback for any application which requires even a little bit of flexibility or impact resistance. This stuff is very, very rigid. And as with all filaments, increased rigidity always comes at the price or cost of impact resistance. Finally, the abrasive nature of carbon fibers, as you may know, can lead to increased wear on the printer's nozzle, which does require special considerations like a hardened steel nozzle. And of course, there's the price. PCCF routinely goes for 80 to 150 bucks a kilo, so don't waste that on something that would be just as good in another cheaper filament. Now, let's compare this filament. Compared to standard PC, PCCF does offer that enhanced stiffness and dimensional stability due to the carbon fiber content. And given how prone to warping polycarbonate is, that's a welcome improvement here. But what about comparing it to carbon fiber nylon, or another really, really popular carbon fiber composite? Well, I like to think of it this way. Both of them have a lot of the same characteristics, but with PCCF, you're trading a little bit of that durability and impact resistance for increased rigidity and heat resistance. Now that is to say that PCCF is going to be more rigid and better in high heat situations, but less shock absorbent. Printing with PCCF comes with its own set of challenges. As far as temperature settings, it requires higher extrusion temperatures, typically around 260 to 280 C, and a heated bed temperature of 90 to 110 which is gonna rule out some lower cost printers. A heated chamber is also highly recommended to prevent warping and to ensure dimensional accuracy, especially for larger prints. So this rules out even more of those lower end consumer 3D printers. Now, due to the abrasive nature of carbon fibers, a hardened steel nozzle is absolutely necessary to avoid rapid wear. Again, no surprises there. And similar to standard PC, 
PCCF is hygroscopic and it should be stored in a dry environment and if possible, printed directly from your filament dryer to maintain quality. PCCF is ideal for functional parts that require high strength and rigidity, such as aerospace components, automotive parts, and mechanical gears. It also is well suited for prototyping functional parts that will be subjected to high temperatures or mechanical loads. Up next, let's take a closer look at chinchilla filament, a TPE or thermoplastic elastomer based material produced by NinjaTech. Though most of what I say here will also apply to other brands of TPE as well. This particular filament by NinjaTech is notable for its 75A shore hardness, indicating a super high degree of flexibility and even elasticity. Chinchilla filament stands out with its remarkable flexibility and soft touch feel making it ideal for prints requiring a soft rubber-like texture. And its 75A shore hardness means that it's much softer and much more flexible than many other TPE or of course TPU filaments. This filament is designed to be as stretchy and compressible as possible with really excellent durability and resistance to abrasion. Holding it in your hand, you really can't help but be shocked at just how ductile and soft this stuff really is. I kind of want to print myself a full mattress out of it. It's that nice. Now, a major strength of chinchilla filament is its capacity to create parts that can withstand ridiculous amounts of bending, stretching, and compressing without losing their form or breaking. This makes it perfect for applications needing a very soft, flexible material, which is great because chinchilla brand TPE is actually rated safe for skin contact. Ari, is it comfortable? Yeah. Really comfortable? Yeah. However, its softness can actually, of course, be a limitation for projects that require any kind of rigidity or structural strength. If, if you need any kind of rigidity, this is not the filament for the job. Also, like many flexible filaments, it is challenging to print or can be challenging to print due to that elasticity. Oh, also, it's $104 a kilo. It is not super affordable, but then again, none of the filaments on this list are bargain buys. Chinchilla is softer and more flexible than many TPU filaments, which typically range in a shore hardness from 85A to 95A. While TPU offers a balance between flexibility and rigidity, Chinchilla leans more towards that extreme flexibility, making it more suitable for applications that really need that soft, more rubber-like material. To be honest, considering how flippity-floppity this filament is, I was really expecting it to be a nightmare to print. But I threw it on my Voron 2.4 with the same settings as Piba, and I was shocked that after some initial trouble loading it, it just kind of printed, at least until the filament path got obstructed on the other end of the Bowden tube, at which point I canceled it because I didn't want to waste more of this precious filament printing benches. Anyways, it prints great at 240 hot end and 75 heated bed, nice and slow. Nothing special here if you are used to printing flexibles. Now, I don't know if this is because the Clockwork 2 on my Voron is just a fantastic extruder or what, but this stuff was surprisingly pleasant to work with. Despite the fact that it's so smushy, you can actually see it flexing and bowing under the nozzle, the print still turned out amazing and I definitely want to use this stuff way more often. Chinchilla filament is ideal for creating objects that require that soft, flexible touch, such as grips, gaskets, wearable items, and flexible hinges. If you've ever worked with TPU and found that it is flexible, but doesn't feel all that good on your skin, chinchilla is the material that you've been looking for. Its ability to absorb impacts and resist abrasion also make it suitable for protective gear and parts that are subject to frequent handling or movement. And because of its safety rating for contact with skin, mixed with that pleasant, almost peach skin fuzzy finish, I'd recommend using it for things like handlebars or tool grips or anything that is going to be touched a lot. Personally, because it's so squishy and pleasant, I'm actually going to use it to make a foam-like cutout for my Stream Deck's rugged case, just to protect the buttons and dials when I throw it in my bag and transport it. Though, then again, considering the price, I might just cut it out of foam too. <laughs> so far, we've talked about a few really interesting 3D printer filaments that you can print at home, and I have plenty more coming up. 
But you know what you can't print at home? Aluminum, or titanium, or stainless steel. You probably also don't have the machinery to handle injection molding, sheet metal fabrication, CNC manufacturing, or PCB production. Fortunately, you don't have to thanks to this video's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is your one-stop shop for all things fabrication, whether you need a handful of custom PCBs for your next project or industrial-scale injection molded products made for a commercial project. They have you covered. They also offer affordable pricing, fast shipping, and fantastic customer service. Plus, if you join using my link in the description below, you get a sign-on bonus for your first order. PCBWay is our longest standing sponsor and one of the biggest supporters of this show, so please make sure to check them out for your next project. All right, let's get back to the video. Up next, let's talk about polyvinyl butyrol, or PVB. This filament is gaining popularity for its unique properties that offer both aesthetic and functional benefits when used for 3D printing. PVB is known for its excellent transparency and smooth surface finish, making it an ideal choice for prints where clarity and aesthetics are paramount. It also boasts pretty good impact resistance and flexibility, providing a balance between strength and malleability. Now, one of the standout features of PVB, really the one that I think of when I think of it, is its compatibility with easier and safer post-processing techniques. You can smooth it with just basic isopropyl alcohol, and this can significantly enhance the final appearance of the print. Yes, you can of course smooth ABS or ASA, but you'll need to do that with acetone or other harsh solvents, which are both more difficult and more dangerous to breathe in. Alcohol, on the other hand, is safer and easier to work with for vapor smoothing, though I've never had a lot of fun vapor smoothing PVB personally. Now, the main strengths of PVB include its superior surface finish, transparency, and again, the ease of post-processing. It's also pretty affordable at $25 for a 500 gram spool of prusament. However, its flexibility might be a drawback for applications that require structural components. PVB's sensitivity to moisture is also another factor to consider as it requires very careful storage and handling. Also, it stinks like a combination of chemicals and old cheese, even when you're not melting it. Compared to more common filaments like PLA and ABS, PVB offers a smoother finish and again, better transparency. I feel like a lot of these sections are a little redundant, sorry. While it doesn't have the high temperature resistance of something like an ABS, it compensates with better aesthetic qualities and less brittleness. Unlike more popular transparent filaments like PETG, PVB is so much easier to smooth and finish, making it much more suitable for detailed or aesthetic projects. PVB is relatively user-friendly in terms of printability. It prints best at extruder temperatures of about 220 to 250 with a heated bed temperature of 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. And unlike materials that require a heated chamber, PVB can be printed on standard open consumer 3D printers. But don't let all that fool you because due to its hygroscopic nature, storing PVB in a dry environment or using a filament dryer is recommended to maintain its printing quality, especially considering that aesthetics are the main selling point of this filament. Now, PVB is particularly well suited for projects where aesthetics are crucial. Can't emphasize that enough. This includes things like vases, where clarity and a smooth finish are desired. Its ability to undergo alcohol smoothing makes it a popular choice for artistic and decorative items, as well as for prototypes that need a high quality surface finish. Personally, I almost never use PVB, but if I do, it's really only for a vase or something that I don't want people to know is 3D printed. Continuing our journey through the lesser known 3D printing materials, let's now explore polypropylene, commonly known as PP. This filament is renowned for its unique combination of flexibility, chemical resistance, and durability, making it a valuable asset in both hobbyist and industrial 3D printing applications. PP filament, gosh, that sounds funny, is considered a flexible filament, but it's important to clarify that its type of flexibility is very different from what you might find in traditional flexible filaments like TPU. Polypropylene's flexibility is characterized by its ability to bend and flex without breaking, rather than the kind of elastic, rubber-like stretchability of TPU. 
Now, this makes PP excellent for applications requiring parts to withstand repeated bending or flexing motions without deforming. To better understand this, think about a car bumper, which is often actually made of polypropylene or the very similar polyurethane. You can't pull on it and stretch it out, but if you bump it or hit it, it will flex and then pop back into place thousands of times if necessary. This is called fatigue resistance, and it, along with excellent chemical resistance, is one of the key features that differentiate polypropylene. Additionally, PP has a low moisture absorption rate, enhancing its durability in various environments. At 35 euros for a 500 gram spool, it's not cheap, but it won't break the bank like many of the other filaments on this list. The main strength of PP, again, lies in its resistance to chemicals, material fatigue, and its ability to just retain its shape after abuse. However, these same properties can be challenging during printing. PP's flexibility and low surface energy make adhesion to the bed pretty tricky. Also, it's semi-crystal in nature can lead to warping and shrinking during cooling. Compared to flexible filaments like TPU, PP offers a unique balance of flexibility and chemical resistance, though it's less elastic. At the time of this recording, I actually haven't been able to get my hands on a roll, but I'm going to try and do so before this video goes live. Printing with polypropylene requires attention to specific details. Extrusion temperatures are typically 220 to 250, a heated bed around 80 to 100 C, all that stuff is normal. But bed adhesion can be a particular issue with polypropylene filament. So using an adhesion agent or even painter's tape may be necessary to get it to stick. While not always necessary, an enclosure can help maintain a stable temperature and reduce the warping I mentioned earlier. PP is ideal for parts that need to be resistant to chemicals and regular flexing. It's perfect for creating containers, live hinges, automotive parts, or any component that will be exposed to harsh chemicals or that just needs to flex without breaking. Personally, I would choose it specifically for live hinges, though considering its ability to take abuse and bounce back, it could also be great for printing toys or anything that is going to come in contact with the little ones. Now, let's shift our focus to CPE, or co-polyester. In this video, I'm specifically going to be testing and talking about the CPE HG100 variant by Filamentum. And it's important to note that different brands may have different formulations, which may in turn behave a little bit differently. Nonetheless, CPE filament is gaining attention for its excellent balance of properties, combining the ease of printing with functional and aesthetic qualities. Let me elaborate. CPE is in many ways quite similar to PETG. It stands out for its high impact resistance and dimensional stability. It's less prone to warping compared to materials like ABS, making it a more stable choice for very precise printing. It has great chemical and heat resistance as well. Really, I like to think of CPE as kind of like PETG+. It does everything PETG does, but better. As I mentioned, CPE is a great filament with tons of desirable properties that make it really superior to PETG in almost every way. At 30 euros for 750 grams, CPE can be more expensive than those basic filaments like PETG and ABS, but that still makes it extremely affordable. Just keep in mind that although it is a high performance filament, it won't match the extreme temperature resistance of specialized materials like Peak or Ultum. As I mentioned, CPE is very similar to a sort of PETG on steroids, but it is different in one major way. Unlike PETG, CPE does not absorb moisture as much, making it even easier to store and print. And if you've seen my history with PETG, you can understand why I like CPE a whole lot more. In fact, overall, CPE is relatively straightforward to print with, but there are a few considerations. Temperatures are relatively normal at 240 to 260 C with a heated bed temperature of 70 to 85. A good bed adhesive or a PEI print surface will seriously help with achieving just the right amount of bed adhesion without warping or on the other hand, sticking too much to the bed. But unlike some advanced filaments, CPE does not require a hardened steel nozzle or an enclosed print chamber. As far as printability, again, you can really think of CPE as 
Pretty much PETG, but better. It really doesn't require any special considerations, the same temperatures apply as PETG, and you might want to use a bed adhesive to prevent it from sticking too much to your print surface. CPE is excellent for functional parts that require durability and a pretty high degree of heat resistance, above and beyond what PETG can offer for you. It's ideal for prototypes, mechanical parts, and containers that might face stress or chemical exposures. Its low moisture absorption also makes it suitable for outdoor applications. Before we wrap, I want to quickly talk about one more unique filament, non-oilin, a pretty crazy filament developed by Filamentum. This filament stands out for being both environmentally friendly and food safe, and some very unexpected characteristics, marking a significant step in sustainable 3D printing. Allow me to explain. Non-oilin is a biodegradable and compostable material aligning with eco-friendly principles. It's actually derived from natural resources, which make it a more sustainable option compared to traditional petroleum-based filaments. Again, nothing surprising there, PLA can say the same. But non-oilin is one of the only filaments I'm aware of that is actually certified for food contact. Though again, actually, I discovered while writing this that Filamentum's normal PLA is also rated for food contact. So that's not too, too special. But non-oilin combines this safety and natural composition with very good mechanical properties, making it suitable for a wide variety of applications. But here's the craziest thing. Despite its eco-friendliness, non-oilin actually has a higher temperature resistance than ABS, ASA, or even CPE which is crazy to me. In fact, I've even been told by the folks over at Filamentum that it's dishwasher safe. As I mentioned, one of the main strengths of non-oilin is its food safety and biodegradability, making it ideal for applications where it might come into contact with food. Yes, yes, I know, 3D prints are not food safe unless you post-process them, micro cracks, bacteria, blah, blah, blah. I get it. Non-oilin also has decent mechanical strength and durability. However, its biodegradable nature may limit its use in long-term outdoor applications or environments where really any kind of long-term material stability is required. But really, one of the biggest, more unexpected strengths is going to be that heat resistance. Non-oilin is, of course, similar to PLA, but with that incredibly high temperature resistance, biodegradability, and food safety. Enough said. Non-oilin requires no special considerations for printing. It just might be a little bit tough to get to stick to the bed, especially if you don't want to use adhesives in order to preserve that food safety. However, if you do want your prints to be food safe, then you do need to use special dedicated hot ends that have never been used for other plastics. And you'll need to do some of that post-processing to eliminate the small cracks where bacteria can get stuck. There, are you happy, Food Safe Army? Non-oilin is particularly well-suited for food-related applications like kitchen utensils, containers, and packaging. Its ability to withstand heat means that you can even make utensils or food receptacles out of it. Its biodegradability also makes it a good choice for disposable items or products where environmental impact is a concern. Now, even if you don't want to go through the steps of post-processing to make your print repeatably food safe, it could be really cool for custom food containers for an event, for example. The best example I can think of is using it for molds. For example, molding chocolate that's gonna be very hot. Though I've even heard about one local hat maker who uses it to mold felt hats due to its ability to withstand the temperature of steam. So there you have it, seven lesser known unique 3D printer filaments that you can print on your desktop 3D printer. If you've enjoyed this video or learned something, please take a moment to like and subscribe. We actually have a huge 100K giveaway event coming up very soon where we'll be giving away thousands and thousands of dollars of 3D printers, upgrades, filament, and much more. But first, we actually have to hit that 100K number. So if you want to be eligible to win, you know what to do below. Also, I want to give a huge thanks to my YouTube members and Patreon supporters, especially our Nylon and Peak members, Chip Cox, Two Crazy Ketos, Amir Khan, Chris Miller, and Don Arledge. And if you'd like to see or hear your name in my videos, plus gain early ad-free access to all my videos, check the link in the description. That's all for this week, but I'll see all of you on the next layer.